Good morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Sharper Iron is underwritten by the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. On this Wednesday, May 5th, we're studying 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 to 10. St. Peter reminds his hearers of the false teaching that is being peddled among them, and then he turns to confirm them in the truth of Christ's second coming. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us returning guest, Pastor Brian Wolfmuller. Pastor Wolfmuller serves at St. Paul and Jesus Deaf Lutheran Churches in Austin, Texas. Pastor Wolfmuller, welcome back to Sharp Iron. Thank you. Great to be here. Wonderful. As we get started, let's talk a little context. What's going on here in Peter's second epistle as a whole in the immediate context? What do we need to know going into this text for today? Second letter that he's writing, he's uh, especially focused on the second coming and the um, the difficulties uh, that come to the church before the second coming. You mentioned that he talks about the false teachers. That's in chapter two, especially. He warns about that. And we know that false teachers are always a danger throughout the entire life of the church, but especially at the end when the devil is making his last stand to try to destroy our faith. So we got to be wary of those false teachers. And then he, 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 he pivots just a little bit. I mean, he's still on that same topic when he gets to chapter three. He calls them now the scoffers, those who mock the idea that Jesus is coming back. And so not specifically the false teachers, but the mockers and how the church is, we should at least expect this, that when the the scoffers come who say, look, today's just like yesterday. Yesterday was just like the day before. Tomorrow is going to be just like today. You Christians with your hope for the new heaven and new earth, um, you you have an empty and vain hope, and so he addresses that that particular problem, and especially as you know, the church is always the waiting church. There's a lot of there's a lot of ways to think about this, Timothy. But we're we're always waiting for the Lord to answer our prayers. We're always waiting for the Lord Jesus to come. It's one of the marks of the Christian life is that we are waiting people, and that's hard. It's hard to wait. And so the devil comes along and mocks us in our waiting. He tries to make our patience wear thin. And so Peter here especially is encouraging us to a patience that um, that never wearies or gets tired, but that steadfastly abides in this hope for the Lord's return. It, with the church being a waiting church, what's what's the consequence if we lose that? If we become, I don't. What's the opposite of the waiting church? If if we stop being the waiting church, what do we become? A, a, what's the detriment? Unbelievers. That's it. Because faith is always waiting. Because the Lord still has a couple of promises to keep. Uh, he has the promise of the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. He has the promise of a second coming. He has the promise of the new heaven and the new earth where the righteousness dwell. That's what he's going to put before us now. And so so the Lord has promises to keep, and so we're waiting for him to keep those promises. Now, most of the promises are kept already. Like Paul said to the Corinthians, all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ. And in his birth and life and teaching and suffering and death and burial and resurrection and ascension and sending of the Holy Spirit, the Lord has kept uh, the majority of the promises that he gave us through the prophets. But there are still a few promises for him to keep, especially that we would appear like he is in glory. And if we think that this is it, that this life that we've got here, that this current state of affairs is all that it will be, then uh, that means, we've, if, in other words, if we cease to wait, then we think that the Lord won't keep some of his promises. And that is, it's, it's simply impossible. The Lord cannot lie. And so, so because there are promises that the Lord Jesus will keep on the last day and fulfill on the last day, we are waiting for him to fulfill those promises. As you were talking there, I was reminded of St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. And, you know, like, if this is all we have, or Paul would say, if, if in this life only we have hope, we're most to be pitied. So if, if we've got it all and we're not waiting for something, What's the point? And, and Peter, mm-hmm. similar idea here? <clears throat> yep, exactly. We, and, and he's going to press it a little bit and say, because, you know, the temptation 
so I, I'm just, I'm bad at waiting for stuff. You know, I'm like, come on, I'm hungry. It's been 32 seconds at the <laughs> McDonald's drive through you know, I mean, just impatient, just in generally, I think we all are tempted that way, but I just an impatient kind of guy. And so the devil comes and he wants to use that impatience, but Peter's going to turn around and say, look, no, first of all, waiting is what we do as Christians. And then second, um, waiting is good. Waiting is the gospel because the Lord is he, the reason why we're waiting is because the Lord is patient and desires none to perish. What a beautiful text. Mm. So the reason why it's taking so long for Jesus to come back is because he loves us. And so we shouldn't mistake the patience of the Lord as his abandoning us, abandoning us or forgetting us or hating us, but rather it's his love for us and for the unrepentant and for the unbeliever. Mm. So, so Peter wants to reframe our waiting so that even, even the delay of the Lord, as we pray, come Lord Jesus, and we wait for him to come in glory, even his delay is a testimony of his goodness towards us. And that's where, I mean, that's kind of the putting the punchline before the joke, but that's where Peter wants us to end by the time we're done with this section. Well, let's go ahead and take a look at what Peter writes here. We're in 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. This is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing this first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlook this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. That's our text for today, Second Peter 3, verses 1 to 10. Pastor Ropemiller, just as at the, the text as a whole, how, do, how does this text come at, at us as a structured? What, how would you arrange this text? Sure. Well, so he's talking, we, we have two paragraphs that we're looking at, and so he, he kind of gives us the purpose for the writing of the second letter. He has a lot of things to say, but he, he's going to hone in on the first eight verses here, or sorry, first seven verses of um, that he wants them to stand against these scoffers. It's really amazing how he describes the scoffers here. Uh, and so that's the first thing. And then, um, uh, and so he's, he, he's reaffirming the fact that the Lord Jesus will come, no matter what anybody says, Jesus is going to come. And then he goes on to, to explicate. So, so he first talks about how the Lord Jesus will come. And then he com comes back around in the last few verses and talks about how um, the, the stall, the waiting is good for us. So we talked about it already before, but how the devil wants to use this delay to testify to us God's forgetfulness. But Peter says, no, the, the delay is God's love for us. He, he pulls back uh, Psalm 90, uh, verse 4, into the conversation. The day is like a thousand years. And he, he tells us why this delay is. There's so much to think about in that Psalm 90 from Moses. And then he says, but, but even though the Lord is patient and long-suffering, this time will end. These gray and latter days will come uh, crashing down, and the Lord Jesus will stand in glory to judge the living and the dead. So we can be assured of that. Uh, we can know, we can see how and why we can understand the scoffers and why their mind works the way it does. And then he can he shows us the mind of God, and we can understand why the mind of God works the way it's working as well. So we'll work our way to that punchline, as you said earlier. Here we at the beginning. Peter says, it's the second letter I'm writing to you, assuming that the first letter is is First Peter in all likelihood, right? I think so, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I know there's maybe some debate among commentators, but that certainly seems quite quite reasonable to assume that. And I think, I mean, the more that I've looked at these two epistles side by side, you see a lot of similarities, even if, you know, language may be different here and there, but the themes, they, they line up quite nicely, I think. And and one of those things is this word that he, he addresses his readers. He calls them beloved, which I, I think yeah. is pretty significant here in the context. Certainly, he's just gotten done in chapter two, coming down really hard on the false teachers. I mean, we don't have to rehearse everything there, but they're, well, it's it's pretty ugly. But here he's reminding his his Christian congregations that he's writing to, you are the beloved of God. Right. That's right. Beloved by God and also beloved by beloved by Peter. Uh, and if if the context of Second Peter is that Paul has left Rome and gone over uh, to Spain, and Peter is now writing to the churches that Paul cared for, there's something really wonderful there as well that that Peter's able to serve as a pastor. Um, to these churches that Paul had started and blessed, and and that um, what the, the 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 it's one of the marks of Saint Paul his deep love for the church. Like when you read Philippians, you it's just on every page you see how much he loved the Christians there. It's really wonderful. But then but that love is shared by the pastors, so that so that each pastor loves his flock. But then you know your people there, you love Timothy, but by sharing in the office with you. I also have this kind of shared affection for them. And, and same with the, with the saints here that I know and love and serve that, that you knowing me and knowing the congregation also love and care for them, even as a distance. And, and that is, you, you see that here with, with Peter B- beloved, he calls them. Uh, he, you are uh, loved not only by God, but also by me. And there's something really wonderful that, the Lord who is love binds us together in love. It's beautiful. So, I mean, I could, I could come to St. Paul Austin and preach and begin my, my sermon, Dearly Loved Saints of God, because yeah, they're right. loved by God, but then also, and even if I don't know them all that well, maybe I recognize a few faces here and there from other Texas district events, but even if I don't know them all that well, I can say in truth to them, Dearly Beloved, and they can say it back to me. You could do the same here in Smithville yeah. because of this bond that we have in Christ. That's right. And the way that love looks, I mean, and we know this too, that the that love looks differently according to commandments, according to the vocations that we have. And the way that, if you were to visit St. Paul, the way that you would love the people here is by preaching to them. And the way they would love you back is by listening to you. So you stand up to preach. That's saying, look, I love you and I'm serving you here. And they listen, which is to say, we love you too. And we're listening. So the way that love looks between pastor and people is preaching and hearing. God be praised. And so the way that love looks between Peter and the, and the churches of the diaspora that are receiving this letter is by he's going to give them his wisdom and comfort from the Lord's word. And they're going to receive that from him. And so he, he continues then in, in both of these letters, the previous one and in this one, he says, I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder. Peter's used language about the the equipping of the mind or the the one that stands out to me from first Peter is where he tells them to gird the loins of their mind. He he wants Mm -hmm. this is Mm -hmm. a living and active thing that Peter's talking about when he's giving the word of God to these Christians. Right. Christians are to be thinking people. You do not have the option of being a fool if you're a Christian. That's not the Lord has not given you that that choice. Uh, So and we have to be people Using our minds, uh, that's, this is, again, another mark of the, of the Christian, that we are mindful of these things. And, and Peter's pointing out the danger of forgetfulness, that we forget the scriptures, that we forget the prophets, uh, that we forget the things that the Lord says, that we forget the things that Paul's written. That's going to come a little bit later after our text, that we forget the works of the Lord. How will we, uh, how will we bless you in the land of forgetfulness? So there's always a great danger in forgetting. And a great blessing in remembering. Jesus even says, do this in remembrance of me when we eat and drink his body and his blood. And so to remember the things that the Lord has done and to know that the Lord remembers us, that he thinks of us in kindness, that he forgets our sins and remembers our name. This is a great, great blessing. So there's a big part of the Christian life, which is the life of the mind. We are commanded to love the Lord with all our heart, soul, mind. And, and strength. And so we don't have the option of being studious Christians. Now, there's a danger, I suppose, of becoming theology nerds 
knowing the truth, being able to confess the truth and articulate it with our minds, but having cold hearts or cold, uh, stale lives, that's, that is a danger. But, but at least here, Peter wants them to remember the things that were taught. And, and so the, the Christian is always, as a disciple, is always a learner. The, uh, th- this is, boy, Timothy, this is important for Christians, for pastors, for all Christians, that when you are baptized, you are put into a perpetual office of student, a student of the Lord's Word. And I probably don't need to tell the people who are listening to Sharper Iron, because that's what they're doing. I mean, they're, they're perpetually studying the Lord's Word. But uh, this is what this is a topic that, that Peter's talking about here. Yeah, I mean, the baptism and teaching go hand in hand at the end of Matthew 28, which I, I wonder if, if that's maybe in the background of some of the things that Peter says there in, in chap, not chapter, verse 2, where he talks about the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. Remember how he, he said, you're teaching them to hold on to, to observe everything I've commanded you, if, if maybe Peter's echoing the words of Jesus. I want to mm-hmm. go back to your, your talk about the remembering and the danger of forgetting. We, we recently had a conversation uh, with another pastor earlier in Second Peter about this idea, and, and he brought out specifically that Christians ought to be mem- remembering in the sense of memorizing things. And we, we talked a little bit about this. You know, we live in a world in which, I mean, if you and I don't know something in the middle of our con- conversation— I can pull up Google right here on my computer and I could probably give you a decent answer. So I don't have to yeah. remember or memorize. Why is that important? I'd like to hear what you have to say about this too. Why is it important for us as Christians to continue to memorize the scriptures? Oh, I can't remember why that's important. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was terrible. That was a terrible joke. Uh, the Lord wants us to write his law in our hearts and probably because... Well, there, there's a lot of reasons here, but the, um, um, it, faith is not just a matter of knowledge, but it's a matter of assent and trust that we're we're leaning on these things. But, but knowledge is a key part of it, and so much of our Christian life is this conversation that's happening in our conscience, where the devil often can get in there and and try to throw us off, and in the, in that conscience we want. We want the Holy Spirit to be there th- throwing around the Word of God to, to beat back the lies of the devil. It's part of the sanctified mind. How can a young man keep his way pure? By meditating on your law, on your words, so that we treasure the Lord's Word in our heart. Um, I, I think in this way, Scripture memory is imperative. Although I have to tell you, Timothy, that, that I very rarely— will oh I better tell you a story about this summer let me tell let me finish this thought though I very rarely will write down a, a verse and try to to put it on the mirror and and work on it every day a word at a time to memorize it I've often thought that I probably should you know there's like whole churches who are memorizing like the book of Philippians which is amazing but I, how I work on my scripture memory is I study a text until I love it until it until it tastes beautiful in my ears it, until it it opens heaven up for me until i until i get a little glimpse of how good god is in the text and once i've done that then i can't forget it then it's there you know i then i, I get so so i think memory memorization is important but but i i love the discipline of scripture memory for the people that have it i'm particularly undisciplined in, in my mind in that way so so the way i i kind of hack the Bible memory is I try to fall in love with a text. And once I've fallen in love with it, it's hard to, it's hard to forget. So that's what I, I, I think it's so important. And, and here's an example of the importance of it. So I, I, uh, you know, I got uh, sick with uh, COVID this summer and I had the, this weird reaction to it, which is basically I lost my mind and um, I couldn't, I couldn't spell my name. I couldn't remember our zip code. I, I lost my balance. I was stuttering. It was pretty, it was, it was like I had had a pretty bad stroke. I think that's probably the equivalent or encephalitis, the brain swelling. Um, and, uh, and I couldn't read, I could read a word at a time and I could sound out words. I hadn't forgotten what the letters were, but I couldn't, oftentimes I couldn't understand a paragraph. And, and when I was really bad, I couldn't understand a sentence. But the Lord, the Holy Spirit was still ministering to me from Bible passages that that I had memorized. Mm. 
And there was a couple that really stuck with me. And one of the most wonderful was the the words that Jesus spoke to St. Paul when he said, uh, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. And those words were echoing in my mind and my heart and my conscience. Even when I couldn't read, they were there. And the Lord was using them to, to, to bless me and to strengthen my faith. And so when we, when we treasure the Lord's word and hold it in our heart, then we have it. No matter where, where we go, we have it with us. And it's good, to, it's good that we go and fight the devil when we go to do that, that we have some equipment to bring with us. Mm. Um, the way Paul talks about it in Colossians 3, I think, that let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Uh, and so I appreciate the the example that you brought up of the way that that you make it a practice because that may look different for for different people. Some you know some youth confirmands do a really good job of memorizing what does this mean? We should fear and love God so that some of them don't do as well of a job of of reciting it as as you know. But there are different ways that the Lord's word would dwell in us, would live in us, even if it's not by what would sometimes pejoratively called rote memory. There are other ways that the Lord's word dwells in us. I think of the the role of music in that. You know, Paul brings that out there in Colossians three. That so that at those moments when you know maybe it is we've we've lost our mind because of a, a, a disease or an old age. I mean, I'm sure you can can think of times where you've visited someone in a nursing home or a shut in at home who who otherwise may not be able to have a, a very a coherent conversation. When you start singing the liturgy, suddenly they're right there with you because that's the word of the Lord dwelling in them. And what a gift that is. Yeah. Carrie's, uh, my wife Carrie's grandmother died two weeks ago, and she had dementia for the last number of years. And yet when people would go in the pastor would go and visit, when uh, my father-in-law would go and visit her and read scripture to her, she could finish the verses. It's amazing to see how how the Lord writes these things on our conscience, and, and that is a, a real treasure. So, uh, you know, uh, Paul will say this, like Peter here, to, uh, to, to write the same thing to you is not wearisome to me, and it's good for you. So the repetitiveness of the Scripture is a, is a good thing. It's a, it, we're to exercise our, thing, our, our minds and our hearts in the Lord's Word. And Peter says the same thing. Look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it to you again. And this is good for you. And, and this reminds us, Timothy, that it's that um, the Bible is not a book to be read and set aside, but rather a book to be to be used and studied. Uh, we, we should we should come back to it over and over again. In fact, the Holy Spirit assumes that we're not treating the Bible like like a dime novel or like a thriller or something like this, where you read it and the whole thing is the plot. And once you got the plot, you've got the whole thing, basically. No. The Bible understands itself as a book that we come back to over and over, that we read slowly, that we study, that we talk about it while we, when we rise up and when we, when we sit down and as we go along the way. And, and so that assumption is really helpful. Peter specifically mentions in verse 2 that he wants them to remember both the predictions of the holy prophets and also the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles – I don't want to put words in his mouth, but that sounds a lot like Old Testament, New Testament, both remember what the scriptures as a whole teach you. Yep, yep. And this is this whole section is a pretty good, um, I mean, Peter is pretty good on this for helping us with the authority of the scriptures. Uh, exactly what you said in this verse, at the end of the chapter, he's going to talk about Paul and about, about how his words were twisted, but how the Lord spoke through him. Uh, in First Peter, he's going to say the holy prophets spoke as they were carried along by the holy uh, by the Holy Spirit. So there's a lot of um, doctrine of the scriptures in in Peter's writing, and this is another great place. So, and and I think Timothy, we should use that language more. We talk about the Holy Bible, the Holy Scriptures. Good. Uh, the old Lutherans used to talk about the prophetic and apostolic word, and I think that's nice because it. It ties the writings of the Old Testament to the prophetic office, and the writings of the New Testament to the apostles' office. There's a, you know, that's one of the reasons why there was a big argument in the in the early church about, for example, Hebrews was it written by Paul? Mm-hmm. It was it apostolic because it mattered if it was prophetic or apostolic for for its um, for its place in the canon. 
And we've lost that a little bit just because every Bible that we have has the same books in it and so forth. But but we should remember that it's when we're reading and studying the Bible, we're reading and studying the words of the prophets and the apostles. In the rite of confirmation, I've, I've been going through this with some youth confirmants here at Grace recently, and one of the questions actually does use that language. Do you hold all the prophetic and apostolic scriptures to be the inspired word of God? And I always make sure to explain to them what what is it that you're going to say, I do believe the prophetic scriptures, the apostolic scriptures, this is what we often call the Bible. But I do think there is there is great value in in using that language as I mean, and because it's in the scriptures here, it's it is. And I, I do love the way that, you know, Peter puts them side by side. As you said, he'll do it again later in this chapter. He's done it already in the first chapter where he was talking about what he and James and John witnessed on the Mount of Transfiguration. And then he says, we have this this very sure prophetic word as well. I mean, over and over again, Peter is holding up in this epistle the importance of the word of God, that we would remember it, that it's the foundation of our faith, and it comes from the prophets and the apostles both. Yeah, that's right. It, and so I misspoke. It's not in First Peter, it's Second Peter. The holy prophets spoke as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. In in First Peter, he talks about being born again through the word. So there he talks about the efficacy of the word too. So it's it's wonderful that I mean, in some ways, you almost see the Holy Spirit smiling because one of the great fights that we have to have still, I mean, the last 600 years, we've had to have, have this fight with our friends in the in the Roman Catholic Church about what is authoritative in the Church. Is it the Scripture and Scripture alone as the sole um, infallible rule of faith, or is there another infallible rule, the magisterium and the Pope and so forth? You just see a little smile on the face of the Holy Spirit when he puts all of these texts about sola scriptura in the in the writings of Peter, who the Catholic Church wants to be the first pope. <laughs> and so the first pope is pointing us to the scriptures and saying that's where the authority is. God be praised. That's fantastic. You're listening to Sharper Iron here on KFUO. Pastor Brian Wolfmuller looking at 2 Peter chapter 3 with us. We're going to take a short break, but we'll be right back. Please stick around. Since 1978, Lutheran Church Extension Fund has had the humble privilege of supporting Lutheran Church Missouri Synod Ministries and her workers. Thanks to faithful investors, LCEF has provided thousands of church workers, congregations, schools, and organizations with the low-cost loans and resources they need to reach more people with the saving name of Christ. To learn more, visit lcef.org or call 800-843-5233. 800-843-5233. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Wednesday, May 5th. We're studying 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 to 10 with Pastor Brian Wolfmuller. He serves at St. Paul and Jesus Deaf Lutheran Churches in Austin, Texas. Pastor Wolfmuller, prior to the break, we we're looking at the first couple of verses. Peter wants to remind his hearers of what he has taught them, that they would have a stirred up, sincere mind. And so now he's going to specify a little bit more about what these scoffers, as he calls them, what their scoffing entails. He spent chapter two really talking a lot about the way that their false teaching has led them to live in all these false ways and the various sins that you see in their lives. Here he details a little bit more of what their actual false teaching is by calling them scoffers and then by giving us a a quote of sorts of what they would be saying. Help us into what Peter says about these scoffers and their teaching. Sure. It says they follow their own sinful desires, which I've been thinking a lot about that, Timothy, how the the Bible understands that the person who follows their desires, that is the person who does what they want to do, is a slave to their own sin and their own desires. But that this is exactly what the devil is pitching to us as freedom. Do what you want. Mm. So that you want to be a free person? Well, don't listen to the Lord's commandments. Don't listen to the restrictions that the Lord says about reality or whatever. Do whatever you follow your desires. Do what you want. Do what feels good. And then you'll be truly free. So that the devil has and he the devil has won the day with this argument in our culture. It says you want to be free, do what you want, so that we have all these people who think that they're free and they are really slaves to themselves. 
I, I so I invented a Greek word trying to figure this out. Auto doulos, self enslaved. Mm. Maybe ego doulos, slaved to the e- enslaved to the ego, slave to the sinful desires. So we're trying to. It's what it's Psalm two says. Let us cast his bonds from us. Let us burst his cords. We want to be free from the Lord's restrictions because we think that is enslavement. When really, the opposite is true. So just a, it's something to think about. But but there's a theological. No, not a theological. There's a there's an ethical, moral, philosophical rationale that sits behind these scoffers. They want to follow their own desires. So they say, where's the promise of his coming? Ever since the fathers slept, things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Nothing changes. Today is like yesterday. Yesterday was like the day before. God, you, you say that God's coming back, that God intervenes, that God judges sin. Where? I've never seen it. Now, there, this is what we can identify as hedonistic Epicureanism, which is a just a simple way to say that you have philosophical backing for doing what you want. But interestingly enough, Epicurus, the guy who invented Epicureanism, <laughs> said that there's two things that we have to believe if we want to have an untroubled life. They are, number one, that there's no judgment when we die, and number two, that God doesn't get involved in things, or that the gods don't get involved in things in this life. God doesn't intervene and there's no judgment. Epicurus would talk like, well, even if it's true, we have to ignore it because we want to live a a life free of trouble. And this sounds an awful lot like the Epicureans here. Where's the promise of his coming? God doesn't judge. Now, Peter says they willingly forget that God created the world by water and the word through, or I should say, out of the water and through the water and by the word and that the ancient world was judged by God with water in the flood of Noah, and that the world now is being held in place for a judgment of fire. So we know that after the flood destroyed the world, the Lord put the bow in the sky to remind us that there would be no more judgment by water. So the second judgment is a judgment of fire. And so that fire is coming. Uh, The day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. That's what Peter here, here calls it. So he's taking this Epicurean argument head on, and he argues, no, God does intervene. Remember the flood. They willingly forget. Remember the flood. And remember the promise of the last day and the judgment that is to come. Hmm. Uh, Water, once again, factors pretty heavily here for Peter in in chapter 3 of this epistle, and so does Noah. I, I was thinking about this before our conversation. It seems that Paul really likes to preach on Abraham. You know, he shows up in, mm-hmm. in Romans and Galatians. Peter really seems to like Noah. And, and not that, mm. you know, I mean, and I don't know what to, you know, in chapter three of the first epistle, you get that, that discourse about Noah and those days and how God saved him and his family through the water. Noah has shown up earlier here in this epistle in chapter two. And, and here you get Noah and the flood and water again. Uh, what's, why, why Noah? What do you think? Well, there's, a, I mean, the two great examples of judgment were the flood of Noah and Sodom and Gomorrah, and Peter brings them both up, and so does Jude as well. Um, uh, what I, this is my, I got to see if this is a pious way to say it. The the flood of Noah and the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah are like dress rehearsals for the last day. Hmm. So if you want to know what the ju- if you're talking about the second coming, it makes sense that that Noah that the flood of Noah would come up. Jesus himself says that in the the days of um, on the last days it'll be like the days of Noah. And so Jesus himself makes that connection, and I think Peter is mm. is reflecting on that. Yeah. Um, so so just like the time before Noah, when Noah was preaching righteousness and the people were not listening. No one was listening to, to Noah. He preached for 120 years, and he had nobody join his church. Or if they joined, then they left <laughs> before the end. So can you imagine? I mean, I, 120 years and not a single adult instruction, not a single baptism, I guess, mm. not a you know, single circumcision, not a single adult circumcision. <laughs> wow. uh, I, I guess no one was before that. But you know, nobody comes into the church for 120 years of ministry. And uh, and then the destru- and then the flood comes and then destruction comes mm-hmm. and so 
And so Noah is that creature that was being mocked, that was being ignored, that was declaring the only way to be rescued and, and was not, and was not heard. So it really makes sense for what the people are thinking of and, and wrestling with and struggling with that Peter is writing to. Mm, yeah, I think, and I'd, I had forgotten about the words of Jesus. I'm glad you brought that up. That makes, that makes a lot of sense that Peter would have been reflecting on what his Lord had said and it comes up. And then as you said, the parallels between Noah as the herald of righteousness and, and Peter and the pastors and these congregations in Asia minor and, and their similarities, it, Noah stands as a, a perfect example from the Old Testament for him to bring out. Before we pass it by too quickly, this this matter, it, it strikes may strike us as a little odd, where Peter says the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. What, I mean, you know, when we talk about creation, we usually say, how did God create by his word? And, and Peter certainly has that here. But what is this matter of, how does he put it, out of water and through water? What, is, what does that mean? I don't know if I can say much more than if you remember that, uh, number one, when we first find the, the earth in Genesis 1, verse 2, is it? It's, it's covered in water. The Holy Spirit was hovering over the face of the water. And then the Lord begins to speak. And then on the, um, on the third day, the second day, the Lord divides water and water. And then the third day, the Lord divides the water from the land. And he pulls up the land out of the water. And so that, that that's the best I can do on that. I, I'm there's some who, you know, uh, it, when you go back to Greek philosophy, uh, I don't, they, well, I'll just say it real quick. When you go back to Greek philosophy, they are always wondering what are, what is the essential element? What is the atom? What is the one thing that everything is made out of? And some said it was it was earth, and others said it was fire, and some said it was air, and some said water. And some said it was a mixture of all four, but there's a, there's, so there was a whole big philosophical conversation about what is the fundamental building block of the cosmos. And, um, and so some people would suggest that Peter's answering that question and saying the fundamental thing is, is water. He's delving into that theology. I don't, but I don't know. I don't, I don't want to say that. I, I think that, that Peter's probably just reflecting in a way that would have been very comfortable for the people. He's reflecting on the way that the Lord formed the, the world in the very beginning and, and connecting and, and the book of Genesis does this too, connecting the separation of the waters on the second day, the waters in the sky versus the waters on the, on the earth that they were then unleashed in the flood and, and brought in destruction mm -hmm. so that, so that there's a connection between what there's a connection between the creation of the world and the destruction of the world in the days of Noah and and we and and Peter wants to make that connection now. So there was water in the creation, and then in destruction, and now we're waiting for the fire to come and destroy. Mm -hmm. So in I don't in, know you you have thoughts on that. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Well, if you I, want to press it, I don't know as much Greek philosophy as you do. I would imagine, but what you said matches up with some things I've actually been reading recently. Having listened to, to some other conversations you've had, I, I picked up a, a book on some introductory philosophy thoughts, and I've I've delved into some of that. What you're talking about, what's the what's the atom, and so I, but I think I think Peter really the way it is phrased, it, he founds what is what is all of reality about. I mean, it, it goes back to the word of God, you know, the form <laughs> out of water and through water, you can see how that plays out in the book of Genesis, just on a very, you know, a narrative level. That's how it happens. You've got the earth that's formless and void, the spirits hovering over the waters, and then by his word, the Lord, you know, does his work of creation. And so that the word is ultimately the foundation of, of all of it. It is, how does John put it? Yeah, through the word, all things were made. And without the right. word, nothing was made that has been made. Peter, I think, has the same thing going on. And then just as in terms of his argument, what you said, I think, also makes sense that he's, he's taking this from creation and how the water was there and then how God used the water to enact destruction in the days of Noah. And then that same destruction is coming. All of it in answer to the scoffers who are saying, look, everything's just going on as it always has. God's never intervened before. And Peter says, you guys have forgotten this on purpose, which I think that's, that's quite something. You know, they've, they've deliberately forgotten what the scriptures teach. Um, so, I, I mean, I think hopefully, does, does that add to it or maybe just confirm what you it said? Does. It really does. 
and, and made me think of something else, too, because one of the great dangers we have now is the this delusion of, of evolutionism, which says it's, it's a foundational argument is that that the creation that we know happened apart from the Word of God. Mm. And if we can do that, if we can separate creation from the Word of God, then you can get away with just about anything you want. And so this is what these Epicurean, what the scoffers were doing then, and it's what our our modern scoffers are, are doing now. Hmm. Well, and it's quite something how the, if you can get away from the word of God in creation, then you're also able to get away from the word of God in judgment. And I mean, I think those two things seem to go hand in hand with what happened in Peter's day and what happens in our day that, you know, if there's no judgment and, and God's never really interacted with anything in his creation before, then I could just do what I right. want. And, and again, right. it seems like freedom, but it's not. No, right. Exactly. So he, he continues then in, in verse eight to turn more specifically to the second coming of Christ. And you mentioned this earlier that Peter brings up Psalm 90, which is a, a Psalm of Moses. How does Peter make use of Psalm 90 here? The Psalm of Moses. And the oldest Psalm that, uh, that, um, that we can figure in the scripture, Psalm 90, what a unique Psalm. Here's how we use Psalm 90 uh, here at St. Paul. And I've used it in my ministry and that is when we have a funeral and the casket is being closed. And during the closing of the casket, I read Psalm 90 because it's a psalm of mortality. It's a psalm of the limit of man's days. I'll just open it up here and read a couple of verses from, uh, from it. It's a psalm of the fear of the wrath of God, really. Um, uh, Moses teaches us, Lord, you have been dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You return man to dust and say, return, O children of man. For a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it's past, or as a watch in the night. You sweep them away as with a flood. They're like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. For we are brought to an end by your anger, by your wrath we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins, in the light of your presence. For all, for all our days pass away under your wrath, and we bring our years to an end like a sigh. This is the old, uh, the old man verse, next, verse 10. Uh, the years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80, yet their span is but toil and trouble, and soon gone we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger? Uh, that's the our three score and ten or four score, the seventy or eighty years. The, so the Lord allots us 70, 80, 70 to eighty years, and if we live past eighty, we're in the bonus years. <laughs> but that's what the the typical span of of life is: seventy to eighty years. That's it. Now, now, um, so here Moses has a psalm of mentality, and right in the middle of it, he says, he says, a thousand years in your sight is like yesterday. He doesn't even say like a day; it's like yesterday when it's past. Just gone. Thousand years for the Lord is like it's like a day, and I think okay. So I got a couple of theories here that I've been working on, because that text, Moses, uh, Moses Psalm ninety, and our text, Second Peter three, and Revelation twenty, are the three places in the Bible where we learn about a thousand years, and the text in Revelation twenty is a big controversy. That's where the whole debate about the millennium comes in. So I've been studying these three passages quite a bit. Uh, in the last few years. So here's my theory, first theory, is that there's a, that Moses uses a thousand years intentionally. Moses knows that the oldest person to ever live, Methuselah, lived to be 969 years. And we look astonished by it. 969 years of life. If someone was 969 years old and died today, they would have been born, I mean, you know, before the Middle Ages. They would have been born back during the time of the Crusades. It's incredible. Hmm. 900, we can hardly fathom a life that's 969 years. And the Lord says through Moses, you know, no, none of you guys ever made it a thousand years. <laughs> the oldest of you, the most vigorous, the strongest man ever to live, Methuselah, made it to 969. A thousand years to me is like like yesterday, like a day. It's no big deal. 
So the 1,000 year stands is the age which no one has ever reached. And yet for the Lord, it's, it's nothing. 1,000 years is nothing. So, so then Peter takes that 1,000 years up to describe the time of patience between the ascension of Jesus and the second coming. So he says, we're, it's true that God hasn't returned in judgment, that Jesus hasn't come back to judge the living and the dead, that we haven't seen the last day yet. It's true. That's true enough. But that doesn't mean it's not going to happen. It just means that the Lord is patient, not wanting to perish. And he pulls in this psalm as a way to describe the Lord's patience. Don't overlook this fact that with the Lord, a day is a thousand years. And a day, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient, not wanting any to perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's one of the verses, one of the key verses for universal, uh, the, uh, universal redemption, the Lord's desire for all people to be saved. And, uh, and, and Peter now uses that Psalm 90 equation to describe the time of, between the ascension and the second coming. So the, the thousand years then is this, as you said, it's a, a time that Moses uses. No one ever made it that far, but for the Lord, that's just like a day. And now Peter picks that up in order to preach the Lord as the patient one, which is, yep. you know, I mean, that's something that that's pretty important for Moses too. I, I can't remember if, if we know, do we know when Moses would have composed Psalm 90? Nope. No idea. I'm going to double check that, but I don't think we do. So, I mean, the, with one, and again, I, I don't remember if, if I'm just making this up or if I've heard this, but a moment that, that stands, at least in my mind for Psalm 90, is the golden calf. And, and maybe, and I don't, again, I, I could be making this up, but where, I don't think you read this far. I got to turn back to Psalm 90 now. I don't think you read this far, but doesn't, he asks the Lord to relent in Psalm 90. Mm-hmm. To, yeah, verse 13, return, O Lord, how long have pity on your servants? Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love. Make us glad for as many days as you've afflicted us and as many years as we've seen evil. Yep. So, I mean, with the, with the golden calf, the, the Moses asked the Lord there to relent. You know, he intercedes for, for the people mm-hmm. there, asking him to be patient and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. I mean, it, it just seems like for, for Moses too, expanding this now past Psalm 90 into his full ministry, the Lord's patience is a really big thing for Moses, again, for the sake of saving his people. And I don't know, maybe that's, I don't, I don't want to say too much, but Peter, if he's drawing on all of that, it's, it's like the same things happening here that the Lord is, or Peter is telling the people, look, the Lord is patient. And that means salvation for you. Not, you know, not don't, don't take that as again, slowness, but take that as the Lord's mercy and, and salvation. Mm-hmm. Exactly. No, exactly. Right. I, I, it, it fits there. I, I would fit it. I mean, I just to put Psalm 90, in a, I think I'd put it um, closer to Deuteronomy and, and the afflictions that the people went through. And it just seems like it's a, it's a end of the life sort of prayer, Sure, but that's just my own, maybe I'm, I'm reading into it because of how we use it over here, but it does say, let the faith it ends with this high note or with an upswing, at least let the favor of the Lord, our God be upon us, establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes. Establish the work of our hands so that all the things that we've worked on, let them stand. Don't let them be lost. So, so Moses is praying, Lord, all the things that you've put my hand to do, sustain it even after I'm gone. So that's beautiful. Now, how about this for just to put a capstone on this argument that when Peter uses the thousand years to describe the time of Lord's patience between the ascension and second coming of Jesus, I think that, that the Lord gives that same number then to John in Revelation 20 so that the millennium of John of Revelation chapter 20, uh, the seven times that a thousand years is used in the first six verses, it's describing the time of the Lord's patience between the ascension and the second coming so that they're related to one another in that way. Hmm. I, I, that works. I, I, I think so. Yeah. I mean, cause you know, Peter and John, it's not like, sometimes I think we do this in our, our world today. We, we think of Peter, he thinks these things, Paul thinks these things, John thinks these things. It seems to me that they actually work together a lot more closely. And so I, yeah, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. I want to, we've got about four minutes here, Pastor Wolfman. I want to make sure we get through the, the text. Sure. Take us quickly into to verse 10 about what Peter says there about the day of the Lord coming like a thief. 
Yeah, this is, um, if you, it's sometimes surprising for us to see Jesus described as a thief, at, but Jesus himself, he'll use this kind of language, especially in the strong man parables. He'll talk about how the devil's a strong man and he has his goods in peace. The stronger one comes and overthrows him. Ha, how beautiful is that? And so, so Jesus is the stronger man who comes to overthrow the devil. I love it. Just, that's just great. And so we have that same picture here that Jesus comes like a thief in the night. Paul uses this language. Jesus uses this language when he talks about the suddenness of his own return, like lightning flashing and so forth. And from this, we draw the doctrine of the imminence of the return of Jesus. And that is to say that Jesus can return at any time. There's no, there's nothing, uh, there's no promises yet to be fulfilled. At, at any moment, the Lord Jesus can return and, and return in glory to judge the quick and the dead. And that's an important doctrine, especially as we face the various different theologies of the end times that are are pitched to us in these days. Uh, that all you know, that Israel uh, established as a nation was a fulfillment of biblical prophecy, or the, 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 you hear these announcements of the golden heifer born in the Golan Heights as fulfillment of biblical prophecy. We want to say, no, no, no. Every promise has been filled. Mm. Every promise has been fulfilled. They're all done. Uh, the only thing we're waiting for is the Lord's return in glory. And texts like this, that Jesus will come as a thief in the night, um, it, uh, remind us of that. Mm. With about three minutes here, Pastor Wolpe, help us to wrap things up, particularly on this matter, to go back to our, the beginning of our conversation, that we are a waiting church. What's the, <laughs> the comfort that is ours in Jesus Christ, in his return that could happen at any moment, what is our comfort as we wait? We, we have a little bit of it in the, in the prayer from Moses, Psalm 90, where he teaches us to pray how long. And Timothy, if I've, if I've tracked this down, I think that every writer of the Psalms, I think there's six different authors of the Psalms. I could be remembering this very wrong, but David, for sure, Asaph, the sons of Korah, all of them except for Solomon, he's the one exception, all of them took up this refrain from Moses, and they prayed, how long? Mm. <laughs> so David has three or four psalms, how long, O Lord? Asaph, Korah, how long? And this is the prayer of the, of the prayer of the saints underneath the altar in Revelation. How long till you avenge our death? How long? So we're always praying how long. Now, there's a couple of things to think about. But number one, that means when we find ourselves praying, oh, Lord, how long? How long are th is this terrible thing going to last? How long do we endure these things? That we know that we're not alone, that this is what it means to be a Christian, that we are awaiting people. Those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength and mount up on wings like eagles and run and not grow weary and walk and not faint. So that the Lord has set us in this world to wait for him and and as we wait, we remember that, that our waiting is the Lord's love. Our waiting is the Lord's patience and mercy. Our waiting is so that more and more of our brothers and sisters would come to repentance and be baptized and join the church and the triumph of the saints in everlasting glory. So the waiting is an indication that the Lord loves us. Not that he's forgotten us. Not that he's stuck in heaven. Not that he forgot that he was going to come back. No, it's, it's an indication that he loves us and he loves those around us and he's calling them to repentance. And so we wait with joy. We wait with confidence. We wait knowing that it won't be long now and Jesus will be back standing in glory and gathering us to his right hand and the kingdom prepared for, for us before the foundation of the world. The ble we are the, will be welcomed into the blessings of the father and the eternal inheritance that we have. And he's given us the spirit so that we can wait and we can pray and we can rejoice, and we can suffer, and we can call on his name, and we can believe his promises, and we can be forgiven of our sins, and we can sleep in peace and rise up to serve him, knowing that, that soon he'll be back for us, and he takes care of us while we wait. This, this, is, this is the Christian life, this life of joyful, patient, hopeful waiting for the Lord. Pastor Brian Wolfmuller is the pastor at St. Paul and Jesus Deaf Lutheran Churches in Austin, Texas, helping us today with 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 to 10. Pastor Wolfmuller, thanks for being our guest today. God be praised. Thank you. I'm your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. If you have any questions about 2 Peter or Jude, the next one in this series, or the book of Jeremiah, which we'll be going into after we finish this series, please send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. We'd love to hear from you. 
Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again tomorrow.